Um, but we we start here. We start in the in the site, and you know, thinking about thinking about the character of Squim, et cetera. And so the sort of the topics that we'll cover um, this evening are a design update, an update of lead leadership in in energy and environmental design, um, which we're um, I'll actually we'll get to that. Um, an update on cost and schedule, and then also seeking any kind of comments or questions from you. The um, as 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 I think we've mentioned before, we we start a project listening, of course, but we also said in, in you know in the context of listening, we're lo also looking at the at the existing building. Um, in this case, we found early on sight lines, as in many library public libraries, sight lines are really important, and these are sight lines for both the patron or visitor. So you can come in, you can orient yourself easily, and you can also see where you want to go and see other people. Um, it's also important for the for the library staff who are, who are then able to see who's in the library, who might need some assistance. Um, you know, see, you know, to see ba basically just as a as a kind of a, um, you know, as a as a service personnel to try to make sure the library is um, used optimally. Access to the exterior in this particular case, in the case of um, of the Squim Library, the existing library doesn't really have a great connection to the exterior, and the exterior is actually pretty extraordinary, especially looking out to the um, to the east. Activity separation: what we're trying to do is optimize as much of the space as possible, providing for sometimes dissimilar kinds of activities to occur simultaneously. So, architecture can help there. Flexible space: we realize that while we can um, while we can anticipate what the library is going to be in five years if we're pretty good maybe 10 years but in 20 25 years we'd anticipate that the library is going to change and so what we need to do is provide space that can accommodate that kind of change over a long period of time because we're really we're well we're 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 building soon but we're building for a 50 to 75 year horizon really um Daylight's really important. Um, it's important everywhere. In this particular case, what we realized in looking at the existing building was um, it could benefit from more daylight. Um, the the sort of the the perimeter walls don't actually provide a whole lot of it, and certainly not in the interior of the space, in, in the sort of in right in the middle. Views to the outside, as I mentioned, this is kind of access to the exterior. Um, it's great to be able to come in and go out. It's also great to take advantage of whatever kinds of positive views we have. And we do have a great one to the east. We also, because we're dealing with the entire site, we have an opportunity in the landscape itself to create some views. Movement through the library is always important. It's always important to, to sort of consider the fact that we have really great demand on collections and meeting space and, and study space and social space. All of this has to allow for really easy movement through the, through the library after hours use, um, it's simply in a, a sort of a, a way to optimize a public facility to say that there might be some spaces that can be used after the library operational hours. So these are these are principles that we continue to return to and check design against. Okay. Um, first thing, first place we start is program. So the picture on the left is showing the um, the existing program picture on the right is showing the proposed and what we learned again working with um, with Noah and Megan and and, and Emily um, is that the collections aren't shrinking so we need to provide more collection space um, we also need to provide not only more meeting space or um, yeah meeting space but we also need to provide a greater variety of meeting space so um, and that'll come up as we provide as we show that we're providing not only sort of larger activity spaces where the public can gather in large quantities large groups of people but also smaller spaces spaces where a book club could meet or a tutoring session can occur or students can work on a, a team project together the an, an area that um, that really does need to grow is service and support. Right now, the library is kind of um, is making do in a really tight space, and this providing more service and support space will actually allow the library to breathe a little bit and to for the for the staff to actually um, make better use of the time that they're at the library. So this is the again, this is an approach. This is these are diagrams that that show how the library is growing. Okay. 
So we first look at the site and the, you know, the sort of the characteristics of the site are very clear. It's long and narrow. Great thing about it is it's long on the, it's long and narrow going east west. So we have this great opportunity for south light. Um, we have an irrigation ditch running along the um, the west side of the of of the site, and we also have some views of some one time um, agricultural land and some just open space. The church to the north is a is an existing condition that it's not so much that we're working around the the fact that the parking is right up on the edge it gives us an you know maybe inspires us a little bit to treat that to treat that edge with with care. Okay, next. We start really rough and we started with some, you know, some diagrams basically saying we're going to try to concentrate the parking along Squim Avenue pretty much where it is on the west on the west side of the library. But in this case with a read with a renovation looking to provide some kind of pedestrian access so that pedestrians aren't necessarily having to walk through the parking lot to get to the library. We're also trying to clarify the entry with a, a, maybe a, a sort of a more welcoming entry space on the outside than play space, some play space that can be accessed from the library, and then a gathering space on the east side, which is in some ways a um, um, an extension of the kind of gathering space that we have already with the um, with with the outdoor theater. A um, little bit more parking on the on the north and east of the library that actually takes advantage of the fact that we were required to have fire access anyway. Then we go, then we start to go into the program itself of the library. And again, pretty early on in, in, in our consideration was we want to really optimize the south light. Um, so we sort of, we're, we're going to open up that south wall. We also want to have views through the library. So when you come in the library, you're not necessarily faced entirely with books, but possibly even be able to look through the whole library as a long lens looking toward that open space to the east um looking at the long space of the main the long main space put some low shelving on the perimeter again to try to optimize sight lines low shelving on the south and the north and then having having a service area that where the where the staff can actually see people as they enter the library and 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 also have great sight lines through the whole um through the whole main space and the main space itself focused on views out toward the east. Then we also want to take advantage of the nice flat light coming in from the north if we can. Okay. Um, so this is a this is a, a drawing, pretty highly developed drawing, but it shows how much and where the library is growing, where the additions are occurring to the east and principally to the east and to the south. Um, so we're we're sort of we're clearing out the current staff work area. We're clearing out the current um, the current restrooms as well because those are they're non-compliant for um, for for access for universal access. Um, but what we're doing is we're taking a long bar along the south side, making that really public um, in a way that it just hasn't been. And so when you come into the library, the idea is to be able to, to, to see that public quality. Okay, next. On the site itself, um, just to, this is a, this is pretty highly developed. This is very much where we are now. Um, looking at parking on the, um, on the west side of the library, moving it, pushing it a little bit to the north, um, so that we so that we capture that space for pedestrian um, movement for uh, pedestrian entry from the on the south side, um, elaborating something of a plaza on the west, and then having a pedestrian path along the south side of the building, so we could get back to the east side of the building if we wanted to get back to the um, the the outdoor theater. We also have we're also showing a little plaza on the on the east side of the building, and then we have this um sort of kidney bean shaped um pond there and that's a that's biofiltration so what's happening there is all the stormwater from the paved area is being captured and directed to that so that we don't have to make use of structured um stormwater and stru structured stormwater and actually sort of overloading the city's stormwater um, system. So we're actually handling all the all the stormwater on site, which is which is really great. Um, and then we have a little structure storage and trash facilities in the um, in the northeast corner, kind of closing off that parking and that 
um, that pretty much captures the um, the the site plan, and that's the again the fire access on the north side of the site that allows the fire truck to come in, get to any side of the building, and also to be able to turn around in a, in within the plaza on the east side of the building. Okay, and then um, the program itself. I think uh, Pia will describe this in greater detail. Yeah. Um... So really stepping into the building, we saw it on the site plan, but um, the main front doors are still west facing, um, shifted a bit into the south bar that David was mentioning as like a really public focused portion of the new library. Um, so as you enter through uh, this west side, which is a glazed um, kind of storefront, you get views all the way through these public rooms through to the east side. I'm really trying to focus, um, like David mentioned, towards the east side of the site. So right here on kind of the first thing that you reach on the south is a gathering or a social gathering, casual reading space um, that abuts the large activity room. Um, there's space for classes or larger story time um, and the opportunity with these spaces being paired together um, and indicated by some of these dashed lines is that there's flexibility with these movable partitions um, to either divide this space from the gathering room to make an enclosed classroom, um, to open all of it up to the library, or to enclose really these two spaces together for an extra large um, meeting room that's accessible after hours. Um, and then east of that, kind of separated from those two rooms, is the children's area at the very east end with that outdoor play area um, just east of that. If you're coming for books, you're probably using these double doors to really enter into this main um, collections area. There's that mail and main circulation aisle um, along the south here that leads you towards the east um, and this reading room or reading area. Um, or if you're coming in and you're um, wanting to drop off a book, there's a book drop here. If you need service, that service desk is right across the way. Um, and then what David mentioned earlier from that planning diagram, um, the other portions of the program that we're putting along that north wall is things like the public computers, <clears throat> the teens and tween space, and then two st small study rooms and a medium sized meeting room. Um, and again, kind of organizationally really trying to bring kind of that more diffuse northern light to the spaces that um, are not gonna want high glare or high contrast. Um, and leaving that more to the areas like the kids space where um, daylight moving is a playful part of how we experience the exterior when we're inside. Um, staff work here is really tucked into the north. Um, we're glad to be able to get some extra daylight into those spaces compared to what they have today to make sure that um, where staff are spending a lot of their time, they're getting um, more daylight and some views to the outdoor and then um, that existing west wing, that's the meeting room today, um, that's sort of flanked by these existing earth bermed walls is where we're putting a lot of the um, service elements. So storage, um, the exterior book drop drops into the carts in that room, um, mechanical and electrical, and then the public and staff bathrooms are all tucked into that corner. And then really the focus of the main aisle is to fit as much collection as we can um, possibly fit in there um, to really all lead you towards this east end. Um, we know that's a really popular point of the library today is some morning light that comes in for that east reading room and so wanting to maintain um, a lot of the feel that people have when they're coming to the library today is part of uh, really that approach to the plan diagram here. Um, what that looks like in form as we're looking on the top here um, at that south elevation, David mentioned the benefit of being able to have a lot of south facing um, glazing. And I think one way um, to highlight that that's really beneficial is that in the squim climate, most of the year is really spent in the heating season. So usually mechanical systems are running to heat spaces. Um, and so by having the southern exposure with a lot of glazing, we have the opportunity to really gain a lot of um, 
heat or energy from the sun in the winter months, um, but we're able to manage that uh, direct sunlight in the summer with some simple overhangs to make sure that when we are cooling, we're not having to excessively um, overwork the mechanical system to make up for all of that glass. Um, on that main gable roof, we have um, a handful of roof dormers. And if we look at, this is a section um, kind of cutting through this portion of the building. Um, the goal really there is to try to get more daylight into the main um, kind of belly of the library. That while we have this existing footprint that's fairly deep, um, trying to find opportunities like these roof dormers to get a little bit more daylight into kind of the depth of that building. Um, and then similarly on the north side where staff are trying to do more focused tasks that we're really just focusing on um, north light that's quite diffuse um, and really kind of supportive of uh, more task focused work. Um, looking at the west elevation and if we kind of recall some of the images that were on that very first slide, there's really um, a lot of focus on the the barn vernacular that's local to SQUIM and wanting this building to feel um, at home in SQUIM. So that's really the driver behind um, the gable form. And then we talked about it a little bit, but having this opportunity on the south bar um, to really put a lot of glazing to help uh, build a connection really between SQUIM and SQUIM Avenue and what's actively happening inside the library today. It's a really closed off building that's earth burned and there's not a great way to know what's happening inside if you're not actually inside that building. And so um, there's really this hope that between these high dormers and this west facing glass as a way to announce that um, there's a connection between SQUIM and this building and there's activity happening here that um, patrons might wanna come see. Um, providing some visuals on what that really starts to look like. Um, we've put in some renderings here. So first on the left is the entry approach that if you're either coming on foot or bike or you've come by your car, um, you're entering the site on the west end and this is your approach um, to that main front door. We're showing uh, cedar siding really on the majority of the exterior unless we're using glass. Um, and this is really starting to show, um, trying to build that connection between the people who are maybe spending time outside of that um, main door and the generous entry and then the activity that's happening just inside. Um, the image on the right, you've stepped into that social gathering space. Um, farther to the east here is that meeting room with the children's area beyond that. Um, and really trying to show this connection of both to the exterior towards the south and that meandering path that leads along there, but also all the way through to the east end um, and the play area and the stage and plaza that's happening um, at the east end of the site. Um, the image here on the left, you're stepping kind of, you've come through the vestibule and you're in that main collections area. The service desk here is just to the left. Um, and this is sort of that main um, kind of circulation aisle that takes you towards that east elevation um, that really has a lot of glass to really draw people um, through the building and towards the east. Um, if you're walking along that, you'll look to your right and you'll be um, at that children's area looking not north but towards the south. Um, just with a lot of glazing to make sure that there's a lot of daylight in the children's area. There's um, comfortable furniture for people to use as a family or kids to sit in a little nook and read a book. Um, but just to activate that children's area at the east end. And then if we keep moving, this is that um, quiet reading area at the very east end of the library that connects um, visually and physically out to that east plaza and the stage beyond that. Um, and then last but not least, you've actually made your way through those double doors. And this is a look back towards the building um, with that east glazed east elevation with these wood slats, um, again, to manage heat gain through that glazed elevation. Um, and then the children's outdoor play area with the children's area beyond that. Um, so that's kind of a high level overview of where the design is. David mentioned LEAD, uh, which stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Um, 
achieving elite silver certification as part of the requirement of the project based on its state funding. And so the threshold to get to a silver certification is the requirement to get 50 points um, out of the 110 that are available. So the design as it stands today, we're right around 56 points. So we're in a really um, good place to achieve lead silver. Typically, um, when you submit the design and eventually the construction documentation, um, you want to be with a few buffer points because um, when you submit your information, typically there's some pushback on some of the points. So having kind of in that 55, 56 range is a comfortable place. Um, to make sure that when all our submit submissions are reviewed that um, we're actually achieving elite silver certification for the building. Um, and we wanted to highlight kind of a few of the areas where we're really focusing the effort to try to maximize points. So the first box at the top left here is in the sustainable sites category, which is really focusing on um, creating open space on the site, creating spaces that are planted with native plants, um, and then using all of that to support our rainwater management strategy. Um, and so I don't know how clear it is on your screen, but um, there's the rainwater management, there's three total points available and we're achieving all three of them um, by managing all of the stormwater on the site directly um, rather than um, sending it through the city elsewhere. Um, another place where the project is doing really well is in the energy um, an atmosphere category, which is really about energy use of the building. Um, and so this optimized energy performance credit is really uh, measuring our improvement on energy use compared to a baseline building. Um, and so this project's doing really well. We're getting 14 points out of a possible 18. Um, and that strategy is really supported by the, by the, um, photovoltaic system that's on the south facing gable. You can see it um, a little bit in this 3D view, but those two credits really work hand in hand um, to kind of the credit at the top is reducing the amount of energy you need. And then um, the renewable energy piece really supplements that by um, producing some of the energy on site that you're gonna need. Um, and then kind of the last really big bracket of points is all in the indoor environment, which is focusing on making sure that the spaces we're creating are um, healthy and comfortable for the people who are going to be in there. So it's about um, selecting materials that are low VOC and aren't off-gassing harmful chemicals. Um, it's designing for thermal comfort to make sure that people will be comfortable when they're in this building. Um, it's about daylight, making sure that the spaces where people are spending the majority of their time, that there's adequate daylight levels um, kind of to support our natural circadian rhythms. Um, another one is quality views so that when we're inside buildings, we still have adequate connection to the outdoors um, so that we can see what the weather is doing, um, what the daylight is doing to make sure that even if we're in inside buildings, we're maintaining um, our connection to the outdoor is a significant health benefit. Um, and so some of the ways that we're tracking these credits is the analysis on the top right here is a daylight analysis that we work through um, to make sure that areas where we need more daylight, we can adjust to get more. Um, and then areas where there's a lot of light that we have strategies to manage glare to make sure that it's still visually comfortable for people to be in those rooms. Um, and the one at the bottom here, this is really about solar access or the solar energy that's incident on the building, um, which in early design was informing um, kind of holistically the building design. And then as we are continuing to fine tune, it's informing um, where on the South Gable the photovoltaic array wants to go. Um, and if the solar grant comes through that Knowles has applied for um, the other portions of the roof that we'll want to look to locate photovoltaic um, panels to make sure that we're getting um, optimal production out of the panels that we're putting in. And kind of paired with that um, is one part that we're really excited about um, around the energy use of the building. Um, is part of the 2030 commitment, which was a 
commitment that was written in um, 2005 and really focused on reducing carbon emissions, acknowledging that uh, buildings um, are responsible for 40% of the carbon emissions globally and that building construction and building design has a significant opportunity to play a role in reducing carbon um, and limiting the impacts of climate change. And so um, as we're getting closer to 2030, the, the target energy use reductions um, are becoming bigger and bigger. So for projects built uh, prior to essentially 2025, the goal is to reduce um, energy use by 80% from baseline. Um, the unit they use to measure that is what they call energy use intensity or EUI, which is really um, an energy use per square foot number on an annual basis. Um, so our target when we started design was 21, um, which was that 80% reduction from the 104 EUI baseline. And the energy model that we just worked through with the mechanical engineer we're at a predicted EUI of 18. So we're um, kind of baseline design, we're really excited is actually beating the target that we were aiming for. Um, and maybe an even more exciting piece is that um, with the solar grant that Knowles is pursuing um, through the state, there's an opportunity to get that EUI down um, to as low as seven. Um, maybe lower depending on how kind of that final energy model plays out. But um, when we start to look at numbers that are this low, we're starting to get into that realm of net zero energy. So having a building that um, is producing as much energy as it's needing in the year. And so from a carbon perspective, um, that's a really ambitious goal. This is really to say um, this library, both locally and nationally, is setting a really great standard that's beating the target um, on kind of where buildings should be um, on the front of energy use. So we're really excited about this. Um, it's a it's a really hard target to meet. And so I think it says a lot for um, kind of the decisions that have been made as a whole with the Knowles team um, as to what's possible for a public library. Um, we said we'd give a brief update on construction costs. If you've seen the numbers over the last few months, generally we've been staying the course. Um, so the building renovation and addition itself is right at $4.8 million. Um, there's a fire sprinkler system, a fire suppression system in the building that we're adding. Um, that's about $130,000. And then the site work to redevelop the parking and the plazas and the pedestrian areas. Um, and the bioretention is just over $1.2 million so that we're sitting at a total construction cost for the base scope um, of about $6.2 million. And then looking briefly at schedule, um, David mentioned this is where we were yesterday. So we just had that meeting with the community last night, um, which we're sort of a a third or halfway through our construction document process, um, which really, if you're less familiar with sort of the phases that design go through, this little blue box on the left that is now mostly off screen was our schematic design phase. That's where we're really developing early um, design ideas to finalize a direction in design development. It's um, vetting and verifying that design and kind of dotting I's and crossing T's on um, making sure that what we're designing is feasible and resolving um, some of those trickier conditions. And then when we're in construction documents, it's really about um, documenting that design so that we have a set of drawings that we can give it to a contractor uh, to understand what the intent is and then for them to build it. So that's where we are now. Um, that whole process has been tied to the permit process. So we started um, kind of construction documents and permit around the same time. And you'll see as we kind of go through construction documents towards the end of the summer, those two are also linked together that um, getting a building permit is sort of the final piece to complete construction documents and then allow uh, the project to be bid by contractors um, to then get under construction and have a building built uh, by the end of 2024. And I think other than that, 
We would love to get your feedback.